Hello, welcome to Bible Class Topics. Today, we want to present a lesson entitled, Who May Dwell with the Lord? It's based on Psalm 15, and we will find out that the answer to the question is the one approved by God. We'll begin by reading the short psalm. This is a psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord who swear to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Though short in length, this psalm is full of challenges to those of us who wish to live with God now and forever. David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this psalm, and through the foresight of God, we still have it for our learning. The psalm is easily divided into three sections. Verse 1, two practical questions. Verse 2 through 5a, 11 answers, or 11 challenges, as we'll call them. And Verse 5b, the conclusion to the psalm. Look at verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, once again. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Notice the parentheticals I've inserted into this verse. We'll come back to those in a moment. So the questions are, Lord, who may abide in your temple and who may dwell in your holy hill? Or who may abide, sorry, in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Compare the relationship between sojourn and tabernacle with the relationship between dwell and temple. For David's contemporaries under the Mosaic law, the literal meaning would be obvious. The tabernacle was a temporary place for God's people to worship, while the temple was the permanent site. For those of us living under the law of Christ, our sojourning place is in the church here on earth. And of course our permanent dwelling place is heaven. So when we rewrite, um, when we reread or rewrite the the verse for today's audience, the Christian audience, Lord, who may sojourn in your body, namely the church, who may dwell in your holy hill, namely heaven. We're going to look at 11 answers to this question, 11 challenges. Three can be found in verse 2. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. If someone is to walk uprightly, that means he must sojourn correctly. In the New Testament, Paul told Titus in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. I want to take a longer reading from what Paul had to tell the Colossian church in chapter 3, verses 5 through 14. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, 
put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of, of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you must also forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So who may abide in the Lord, who may dwell with the Lord now and forever? He who sojourns correctly in this world. and works righteousness. He thinks right, he speaks right, he acts right, and he does right. Peter confirms David's point in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him, that is, respects him, gives him all, and does what is right is acceptable to him. The Apostle John concurs in 1 John 2, 29, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. He's speaking of Jesus. And then in chapter 3, 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he, that is Christ, is righteous. Righteousness is our personal possession, obtained by doing God's will. The third answer or challenge in this verse is the, per the person who wants to dwell with the Lord speaks the truth in his heart. He's not a hypocrite. He is what he says he is. Moving on to verse 3. Three more answers to the question, who may dwell with the Lord? He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. He's not a backbiter. We know that the backbiter is a coward. He's not willing to confront a person face to face. We know that backbiting is a brutal and malicious act. If we want to dwell with the Lord, we can't be a backbiter. Nor can we do evil to our neighbor. In addition to not being a backbiter, we can't be a gossip. We can't be a false teacher. We can't be a false flatterer. Nor does he mistreat his friend or his the scripture says, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Not only does he not originate gossip, he doesn't spread gossip either. The God-approved man will invoke the golden rule, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 12, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We find three more answers or three more challenges to being the God-approved man in verse 4. Three more answers. He has an aversion toward those who practice vile things. He honors those who respect God. And when he makes a promise, he keeps it. When we read a passage like, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, we have to understand that that does not mean we hate the person. 
It means we have an aversion toward the person because of the vile things that he does. We understand that the New Testament teaches us that we do have to hate sin, but we do have to love, that is, practice agape toward the sinner. And remember, agape is the Greek word that means looking out for someone else's best interest. However, we have to understand that we cannot fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5.11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. The God-approved man honors those who fear the Lord. In addition to looking out for the best interest of his brethren, he gives them the respect due to a God-approved man. He swears to his own heart and does not change. Let's think about that for a moment. Sometimes we make promises that if we would break those promises, it would be to our profit. This is wrong. If we make a promise, we need to keep it. Jesus taught us to let our yes be yes and our no be no. In the first part of verse 5, we get two more challenges. He does not practice usury. That's the God-approved man. He does not take a bribe against the innocent. The God-approved man does not put out his money at usury. By usury, we mean an illegal rate of interest. In today's vernacular, we're talking about loan sharking. The God-approved man, in his business dealing, as in his social and religious life, is fair, merciful, and compassionate. The eleventh challenge is this. The God-approved man does not take a bribe against the innocent. To testify falsely in a court of law is wrong. That's perjury. Or to manipulate the innocent for money. I'm thinking of land frauds, pyramid schemes, uh, the so-called Ponzi schemes. These things are examples of this type of sin taking a bribe or taking money from the innocent and giving them nothing in return. David makes a very simple conclusion at the end of verse 5. He who does these things shall never be moved. Well, obviously the things here are those things that he's already mentioned. The 11 challenges that he's made. He's challenged the God-approved man to practice walking uprightly, working righteousness, speaking the truth in his heart, not being a backbiter, not doing evil to his neighbor, not to take up a reproach against his friend, to have an aversion toward a person and his activities because of the vile things he does. He must honor those who fear the Lord. He must swear to his own hurt and not change. He can't put his money out to usury, and he cannot take a bribe against the innocent. These are the 11 characteristics, according to David, of the God-approved man. Well, God determines whom he approves. We have to understand in this age, the church is the avenue for us to obtain his approval. We can't do it our, on our own. We have to be a member of Christ's body on this earth. Also, character and reputation are both important to the God-approved man. As one commentator said, what God knows us to be, and what others think us to be. 
the emphasis on work to be accomplished and obedience of faith shows the dire consequences of those who teach a faith-only Christianity or think that an apathetic practice of one's religion is enough to be a God-approved man. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, leave a comment, hit the like button, share this video. All these things would be helpful. Special thanks go out to the folks at slidescarnival.com for designing this PowerPoint presentation, that is the template, and allowing it to be used for free. Also, in preparation of this lesson, I spent much time reading Chapter 4 of Robert Taylor's book, Studies in Psalms. I hope this lesson has been helpful. I hope that you will continue to share these videos with your friends, neighbors, and loved ones. It would be a big help to me and to the channel. Until we can come together to study together again, may God bless.